Okay, Eleanor, welcome to the show. We're so glad to have you here with us today, and we will be getting to know you and what you do as well. In and by discussing how digital outsourcing could be relevant to any industry, even in something as physical as the construction industry, which of course is your forte. And uh, furthermore, by tackling an industry that is less known in the outsourcing community, we can better understand the need for outsourcing, be it in any type of business. But before we delve through that, Eleanor, please tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. First of all, thank you very much for having me on the show. And I love the global feel that both the concept of outsourcing really generates. It really makes the world a very small marketplace, which is a great thing, but also the international uh, sense between all of us. So thank you very much for having me on your show. So I am an ambitious and driven thought leader in the construction industry. I'm the founder of The Construction Coach which is Australia's first construction coach. That's my mentoring, coaching and advisory business. I also have my own podcast called Constructing You and I outsource that. But I interview, well, the production, not the, not the interviewing or the actual podcasting part, but I interview exemplary leaders and industry titans in property and construction. I'm also a number one best-selling author, and from a commercial side, I've also worked in commercial construction for coming up to eight years, time flies, and I've delivered hundreds of millions of dollars of projects with, you know, and really looking at my primary activity has been all about outsource. Very, very interesting. You touched upon an interesting topic, author, uh, best-selling as well. Um, we read somewhere that you wrote a book in eight days. Uh, how do you do that? I can I, hardly read one in eight. <laughs> <laughs> I can only get through a book in eight days now because of Audible, which is fantastic. I have also you know, lost to some extent the ability to sit for long periods of time and read. So I love Audible. But the execution of my first book took eight days. The acumen, the career intelligence, the branding, the messaging, the philosophy, the values, everything that underlies that first book took eight years. So it's the execution which took eight days. And yes, it was a book that I always had in me. And I do strongly believe that everyone has a best-selling book within them. For me, it was just a time for it to come out. And it absolutely went into flow. And I also know that my natural disposition is communicating, whether that's speaking or writing. So for me to actually sit down for long periods of time and just go into states of flow and states of like, higher consciousness in order to just get it all out was not difficult for me because I also spent a lot of months planning before that. So pre-pandemic, we were, we were overseas at the start of the year and I actually you know, sat down and planned. Like I had a very, very good plan. This was the exact structure. So a lot of the thinking was already done. Now it was actually time to execute. And I already had all that through, you know, mentoring my own experience. It was a matter of collating it. So, and also I wrote it come April uh, April 2020 and we just went into our first lockdown so all plans were cancelled and I said if I'm not going to do it now and take full advantage of this lockdown where all plans are cancelled then what am I actually doing so it did uh, take eight days and then it was released in August last year and I'm about to go into publishing for my second book fantastic and and, and one one thing so everyone has a best-selling book in them can you expand on that a little bit? Because I don't feel I have. Uh, <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of listeners will, will have the same opinion. Uh, but you'll, you'll convince us otherwise, I'm sure. <laughs> you know, everyone has a story to tell. Everyone has an experience that is of benefit. Everyone has a guiding philosophy, whether they've taken the time to actually sit down, articulate it, get, cl get clear on that is a different story. But if every person went through the same movements as I did and they really got to a place where they wanted to add value to other people and they really wanted to leave a legacy. I mean, there's many different ways in which you can create legacy it's through business building it's through creating brand assets that will be around for a lot longer than we will ever be that's the intention 
So when people operate from that space of really, you know, overall that's adding value to other people, then yeah, writing may not be the the option for them. You can outsource that as well. But I do strongly believe that there is something that each one of us has experienced in our own unique format that the world needs. Fascinating. Wow. And uh, well, with all your impressive credentials, Eleanor, and you seem to be a very driven woman. Have you, was this always in the plan to write a book? No, no, not at all. I mean, I always thought that it would be a nice thing to do when I'm 60 or 70 when one would conventionally retire, but I never actually put a lot of thought to it. But what happened in my case, I went down the thought leadership mentoring journey and it was through my mentor who really opened my eyes to this whole world that, you know, if I want something, I don't have to wait decades to build up for it. I can actually do it now. And these were the steps to to get there. And I still remember that when he uh, he called me saying that, you know, we thought about it and we want you to start writing a book. I'm like, what? Well, I, I was planning for this like years ahead. But when you actually set your mind to something and when you actually say, you know what? I can do this. I need to do this. It is my duty to do this. Then you'll be surprised at what you can actually achieve for yourself so it was, you know, a, a massive undertaking back then for me. It was putting myself in high levels of vulnerability. I mean, you know, someone is reading your whole philosophy and your whole perspective about everything. So it was a big, bold move, but I'm so glad that I did do it because I remember once there was someone on LinkedIn who posted about the book. He said that he came home from work. It was 11 o'clock at night. By the time that he got around to reading it, he was up till 5 a.m. to finish the book. And I was I was blown away. I still have. This happened over a year ago. And I remember the times when I would stay up all night reading a book because it just drew me in so much and how much that book captivated me. So to be able to do that for someone else was, was and is a huge achievement. Phenomenal. Hey, can, I would like to ask one question. Why the construction industry? Good question. I sometimes ask myself that as well because it's not a sexy industry. It's not glamorous. It is high risk. It is high responsibility. It has a myriad of stakeholders. I mean, people walk into it thinking it's this glamorous thing with cranes and, and whatnot. It's nothing like, well, there are cranes, but there's nothing sexy about that either. So I started my career in architecture because I had the grandiose illusions that I would be this architect dressed in black, show up to site, give a few instructions, and then that would be it. But that quickly came crashing down when I realized what it would actually take. And what I realized through that is that I am a creative, but not in that traditional sense. And architecture was a beautiful profession. It allowed me to see the built environment through a very particular lens and a very deep and rich lens but I realized that my person is far more process oriented. Like I said, I am creative, not in that typical sense. I love to see things come to life. I love having ideas, like going from ideation, from conception to commercialization. I love that process. And then being able to stand back and say, I know we did this. And that's what I love about construction. It affords you that opportunity to stand back literally and look back at what you as a team have all done together and to still be able to drive by that in, in a, you know, decades to come and, and remember where the screws had to go because you were that invested in the project. So I found my way through conventional education into the construction industry. And from the outset, it felt like everything at once and nothing at all. It was this, it, it seemed like the realm to all my questions and curiosities in the built environment. And it felt like an industry standing from the outset that would give me exposure to, you know, everything from finances to legality, to the morality of building, to working with people, to the actual, you know, technical side of things. So I was very fascinated and continuously was able to find my curiosity within the industry. So, so would you then say that there's quite a bit of overlap a bit between building buildings and then creating a book and doing a startup or building your own business and then running your own podcast? It sounds like if you're process oriented, there are quite a bit of similarities there. Yeah, 
Oh, absolutely. That's what I, I love about what I do because I have so many analogies and puns and references. You know, it's like putting on the roof before you put on the facade. Like I can go on for days, but that's exactly how my book is also structured. So this is how you build a building. And then these are the same steps in which you would build a career. Things do need to happen in a certain sequence because if they're done out of sequence completely, then you're not going to end up with the precise end outcome that you initially envisioned. So absolutely, there are so many parallels. And, you know, one analogy that we'll be using until the end of time is having really strong foundations. There's no point having an amazing, you know, beautiful looking building that is going to crack at the, my, at the next inconvenience or, you know, anything like that. And it's the same in in business building, it's the same with getting the right support services, the right teams within under your roof in order to have a business. Any, and that's what, you know, that's how I also think as well. It's like, okay, this is the vision. What are all the steps that we need to do? So yes, yeah, so that's why I love, you know, get going from ideation to commercialization because you get to be like, okay, these are all the different steps. Of course, in real life, things always go wrong. It's, I'm not suggesting that as you would know, this is not a linear process by any, by any measure, but it does show you the importance of every stage. And what it does, it says, well, at this stage, who do I need on my team? Who do I need with me at every particular stage of the build of the business that you are in? Mm, well, Interesting, Eleanor. Now, talking about business, just out of curiosity, what I was wondering what the similarities are in your industry, which is the construction industry, and our industry, which is the digital outsourcing industry. Because these two, to me, they seem like two very different industries. When, you know, when I saw this podcast come up and I'm like, I wonder what outsourcing has to do with construction. And then I realized, hang on, the whole construction industry is outsourced. When we actually think about the building process, so let's say it's a development. So a developer doesn't actually do any building works. They outsource the whole building component to a contractor. The actual contractor nowadays, back in the day, they used to do everything under one roof, but nowadays an actual head contractor, so the person who was responsible for building doesn't actually do any building they outsource all of that to subcontractors the only thing that a head contractor has is cash flow they don't actually they rarely own assets they don't own any of the final products they don't also own the ip because the actual design belongs to designers and the client so we're actually a service in itself but then even the subcontractors, so they carry a lot of the risk and the responsibility and the weight within the industry. But then you look at a subcontractor as well, they're outsourcing or they're relying on, you know, supply chains for materials and everything and other support functions within their business. So that's why, you know, supply chains and, you know, the whole outsourcing conversation is construction is probably not one that is spoken enough. It's spoken about enough because it's just so inherent to us, but I don't, you know, people aren't really looking at uh, where are the efficiencies in the process? Are we doing things well? I mean, if you look at how we, as you know, I work for a head contractor, how we actually procure things, how we actually do the outsourcing part, it's such a tedious time consuming process that is so cumbersome with manual data entry and relies on individual performance. I guess that's one way to put it. It, relies, it has a lot of room for errors. And that's why digitization of a lot of the processes in construction has become so prevalent and successful in really the past decade because it's such a gaping chasm. It's such a gaping chasm in the industry because people are still working off excels that don't talk to each other. People are still... You know, one project is doing something different to another project. So, and this works not just on the procurement or the outsourcing part of the project, but everything from the finances to the safety, like all aspects of both the construction business and project delivery are quite clunky. So digitization is up and coming. I mean, there are companies who use software, but yeah, can we get more efficient? Absolutely. 
That's fascinating. So, so you just made a physical industry sound so digital. Um, and, and one question I have is from your experience, let's say you're putting up a building in Melbourne. Um, how international would that be if you look at every moving piece that it takes to get that building, building up? That's a great perspective. The lifts come from, say, Germany, but then all the components within that one single lift will, can come from five different companies, countries, Japan, the motor's German, the design is, is Australian, so on and so forth. That's one component. Then if you go on to, you know, sometimes if you look at some specified finishes, the stone has to come from Italy. There's feature things that come from who knows where, carpet that come, I've had carpet come from Austria. I've had chairs specified from you know Austria as well. I, I did a fit up project for Emirates uh, five years ago and the joinery was coming from Dubai, the tiles from London, the wallpaper from New Zealand. It's an international effort and then some. It's interesting how the pandemic has really impacted that. So the pandemic has obviously had a lot of impact on supply chains, on availability of materials, on lead times, when we actually need to start the outsourcing process. So it's really, I guess, made people a bit more planted. And especially now, whole facade systems come from China, the whole glazing systems especially when you're doing bulk, say, apartment towers, then obviously you have an item that is quite repetitive, like a joinery unit. That all comes from China as well. So there's people on ground in Melbourne or Sydney or wherever that are purely dedicated to this completely outsourcing function, but then they've got the digital interface of, you know, always checking the, the drawings, everything from checking the drawings to the finances, to the compliance, to doing site visits remotely, so on and so forth. So, so your example is, is, again, fascinating, global, physical outsourcing and building all of these components together. Does that also translate to the digital services that you would require as part of getting that building up and running? Let's say designs, accounting that comes with it and all that. Is that also, from your experience, quite international? To some extent. So, for example, there are some really large companies who, let's say, they get a whole like, volume of invoices. Right? You can imagine if you have, you know, 20 project sites, multi-million dollar, you know, cash flow going around in a month, that has a lot of invoices. So, if someone has to actually get that invoice that gets sent to a generic email and that invoice that needs to get coded to the right project so that the right people on said project can say, oh, okay, you know, uh, company A has invoiced us this month. So that function of matching invoices to a project that is done offshore on a large scale because paying someone here, what, $50 an hour versus paying someone less for the same, if not greater quality of work is more advantageous. So yes, there are, you know, a lot of business functions, supportive functions that do get made, uh, do get outsourced overseas. If you're looking at it from a design perspective, people have their 3D modeling also done overseas. It's a lot cheaper to pay drafters in, say, the Philippines than it is to pay a team who have done $100,000 worth of degrees in Australia and they want to be paid $100,000 as well for the same function. So that also goes overseas. They're just two examples. The list is broad and wide. Wow. Now, again, with such such an international industry, Eleanor, um, and I'm sure there's a lot of process that goes together with choosing partners, but uh, from a bird's eye view, how do you actually choose partners or consider partners? The construction industry is a very cost-driven one. Very. It's incredible, you know you will, I think, seven or eight times out of 10 saying, no, we won't make a decision based on cost, but when it really comes down to it, it does. I've only ever been on a handful of projects where someone who wasn't the cheapest actually got the contract for the works purely because the service, like the extra value that they provided made up for that difference. So it is a very cost-driven industry, but quality and safety and environmental consideration and compliance and you know take mitigating risk for 
a company is also very important. I mean, that's the whole premise of why con contractors actually outsource because they're actually selling their risk to another company. That's all they're doing. They're just passing the risk down the supply chain. Excellent. And, and maybe to, to, to expand on that a little bit, right? So if, if you were to basically get somebody to help you with 3D modeling, right? And, and you say, okay, I want to make it very, very cost effective. Um, where would you start today? Uh, let's say you're, if you, if you were to advise somebody in Melbourne, for instance, where, what would you, where would he have to go to find these 3D modelers? In the first instance, people would typically, like in the contracting model here, they would go to an architect. So again, it, it depends on who's doing what, but let's just basic example, I want to build a house. In the first instance, you would go either to an architect or you would go to, say, a volume builder who has ready-made homes. So me as an individual client, I wouldn't be dealing with that specific function to be outsourced because, again, I've sold my risk on. I hope I've explained that clearly. But so me as a client, I wouldn't be doing that outsourcing. However, if the client is now the architect who does need, or let's say a structural engineer who does need a 3D model of a, a tower being done, then how would they find the person? That's a really good question. And the industry works also in recommendations. It's one of the industries which... If you are someone's friend, you've got a pretty good chance of getting a project because people will call their friend or the person who did a really good job for them on the past project. It's I don't know how it is globally across the world, but I do know that the Australian construction industry is so heavily premised on referrals, referral relationships, people who have literally, they've worked together in 1970, they're still in construction, and they just have someone's number and they'll give you that number. Of course, then once you do get that number, there is the whole, you know, quality assurance and process to go through and pricing, etc., to make sure that they are fit for purpose. But actually getting that lead or putting your name out there or getting that call in the first place comes from that referral network on most instances. That was exactly my question. Thanks. Yeah. And, and I guess it's no different in, in, in many other industries, right? Uh, uh, if, I mean, a lot of businesses rely on referrals or Google for that matter, right? But slowly but surely we see platforms come up like, for instance, Amazon, uh, where, where, you know, rather than asking somebody, you can go and check what the user reviews are, right? And we see this coming up in pretty much every single industry. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering whether the construction industry is going to move down that path as well. It will be quite interesting to watch that. Yeah, oh, definitely. You know, if someone doesn't know, like if I'm looking at a company, not just from a, you know, physical construction or anything, yeah, I'm going to Google them. I want to find out everything. And that's why creating that social proof is so important for a company because you're only as good as your last review. Yeah, and I guess one of the issues with that too is when you Google them, that company will have to have invested in SEO, right? And there could be a fantastic company out there that's actually way better, but because they didn't invest in it, you may never find them, right? So, so hence this, 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 this whole, that's what we are so fascinated about, right? How do we put a structure to something which is traditionally very much referral and Google based? Um, I see it's very applicable in your world too. It is. And the fascinating thing with the construction industry is that you're carrying out one of the most important functions of building construction, but there's no barriers to entry. You, unless you're, you know, if you just want to be a roofing contractor, there's no barriers to entry. You can literally just become one and, you know, a friend who knows you can give you a, a few million dollar job because they trust you. And then boom, you've, you've got a company like that. So how do you, yeah, you know, it's a fascinating question. How do you capture all of that, right? In order to build the business, in order to get really good quality leads. Because you're right, especially at the acting level in the construction industry, very few invest in all of this because many reasons. I mean, sometimes the business owners are still the one physically doing the work. They're working in the business, not on the business. So, and, and not many also see the importance of that whole social sphere because they've been, you know, one thing that I hate hearing in the industry the most is we've always done it this way. 
who said it was working? Just because you've done it doesn't mean that it was working. But another big barrier to entry for anything new of that type is no one wants to be the early adopter. No one wants to carry that risk. And that's why, you know, I've interviewed some people who have developed software for the industry and now they're ultra successful 14 years later. But they always say getting those first yeses in their pitches, like out of 50 pitches, they might have won yes. They were saying getting people to be the early adopters was always the biggest issue. The people who said yes were the people that they knew in the industry. We've always done it this way. I'm pretty sure that a lot of people in your industry say that, Eleanor, but that's not something that is part of your mantra. <laughs> no, it's always been done that way. Gosh, throw it out the window. Well, it's not about, <laughs> it's not about change for change's sake. If change isn't actually required, then okay. But it's actually assessing change. Is it required? Are we addressing the root cause, not just the symptom? Will this actually be better, not just for us now, but for, you know, it, will it be intergenerational change? So, yeah, I don't advocate for change for change's sake, you know, let's just do something to show people that we're doing something. The benefit has to outweigh the cost. Fantastic. And that's from coming from the construction coach. Now, well, going back to you being a construction coach, Eleanor, um, what being the first construction co coach in Australia, for, for that matter, among all other professions, why a uh, construction coach in such a male dominate, especially in such a male dominated industry? The name actually came to me through divine intervention. So I... As after I graduated from university, I started actually tutoring and the conversations with me would always turn from the technical, how does precast get erected to the career focused and the mentoring. And then people would always say, Eleanor, you have such a successful career. What should you start a business on? The one thing that people always come and ask you for advice on. So I actually was on a platform where I was listed as a tutor and then they, the algorithm changed and I got no leads, no clients. So I'm like, hang on, I'm not in control of this. I need to control it. So I asked the universe, it was February, 2019. I asked the universe a better question. How can I reach more people? Because I had these questions when I was starting out in the industry. I didn't know what the industry looked like. I didn't know how I would navigate my career in it, let alone be brilliant in it. And other people had the question. So there must be more of these people. And then it was Feb April 2019. We had a shutdown period in the industry. And it was 11 o'clock at night. And it was it just hit me, the construction coach. And what I also found, you know, parallel to that experience was between technical project delivery, you know, how to erect precast, how to pour concrete, so on and so forth. There was a gaping chasm in my own development. No one was talking about both not just the tactical skill set but the high income skill set and also the mindset and the person behind the projects and that's why i really found the niche is i don't actually talk about the project i talk about the people behind the projects beautiful wow talk about the people behind the project that's very nice. And well, I think this this my next question, Eleanor, is uh, especially important to our female listeners and it will help empower them. Like what advice can you give on being a leader, especially, you know, because you're you're in, in the, this male dominated space? How do you make yourself stand out? Outsource now. <laughs> <laughs> But, but in essence, like, that's important because I, I, I'll expand on that. My zone of genius is obviously here at recording. Like, for me, it's speaking. For me, it's adding value. For me, it's sharing insight. For me, it's being front-facing in my business. I'm not effective if I have to actually sit there and edit a podcast. I hate that stuff. I don't want to do it. And I don't want to learn how to do it either. I mean, I learned the basics for recording, and that's it. So... In order to become that leader and in order to continuously grow, I can't be spending my time on $10 activities or $20 activities. So really valuing my time was a crucial paradigm shift, which is different from being in employment. It was a very crucial paradigm shift. So I can become this person. I'm not effective behind, I'm not effective editing. 
uh, that's just one example, right? I'm not best used trying to come up with visual representations or designs. There's other people who do that a lot better than me. But I, but it's also to say, you know, I I know I have reasonable competence in because otherwise, if I give someone something to do and I don't know what they're doing, then it's a waste of money, and that's how people get burnt. And people then say, "Oh, don't outsource. You should do it all yourself." They just give bad business advice. So that's not the crux of the question. But in order to become that leader, the first part is it's not about me. It's about adding value to other people. I'm I only get to do what I do because I'm adding value to other people. I put the commu- it's community first. It's clients first. It's not about me. I'm just the conduit for the message to come through. I'm the conduit for the vision and at first, yes, you do realize you do think that it's about you, but the more that it grows and the more you realize the impact you're having and the influence that you can have, the more you realize it's less and less about the individual, but more about enabling others to achieve what they want. And when you can do that, that's how you in turn achieve what you want. So first it comes with really realizing that. And that was a huge paradigm shift to me. It was like, hang on, I want to get what I want. The way to do that is to add value to as many people as I can. Then I get what I want. Easy. <laughs> Easy it, right? Okay. That sounds reasonable enough. And the second part is also having a really strong self-image. You need to see yourself as this person. If you can't see yourself as an entrepreneur, if you can't see yourself as a successful business owner, as an industry leader, it won't happen because you cannot outperform your self-image. And this is where people always go, I think, you know, they say, oh, there's there's a ceiling. Yeah, it's the one that you built for yourself. No one else put it there. That's defined by your self-image. So that's a really key thing is seeing yourself as a leader. First, you have to become it in here before anything else happens in reality. That's imperative. And then, you know, leadership as a whole is complex. And the only people who think that leadership is simple have only learned it from a book. And a book can get you exposure to leadership principles. Absolutely. It's imperative. I've learned so much from absorbing leadership lessons from other people. I've absorbed the principles. But then to actually get that leadership experience requires me to do And that means putting yourself out there, trialing and tweaking and failing and learning as you go, so on and so forth. That's imperative to the process. But then how can you actually shorten the process? It's getting a mentor. It's getting a coach, right? It's getting that person in the marketplace who has the results that you want and they can bypass a lot of the time that it takes you to get there. Because I don't have the time to read, say, all the leadership books or all the podcasts and go to all the... I don't. I want I want the results and I want them yesterday. So I'm not, I'm not that... Uh, I move fast, but not that fast. So, yeah, working <laughs> with a mentor is, I think, absolutely imperative. And I wouldn't be here having this conversation if it wasn't for my mentor. Oh, wow. Those are a lot of points I'm taking away from this. Adding value to others very strong self-image, getting yourself out there and um, getting a mentor. Wow. (laughs) And uh, you started off really well as well. And we say the same thing. Do what you do best. Outsource the rest. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Absolutely. And the whole falter with that is it's all to do with the money mindset. And even in business, people will think, you know, if I do it in-house, I'll control it. Yeah, but okay, that might be a cost. Let's say a contractor costs you $50,000 a year to say, do your accounts. Right, but what about your time? Have you quantified that? It's where people don't quantify their own time and where they don't quantify the opportunity cost. So plus, plus, plus. Yeah, it's negligible building uh, business behavior. I'm with you. The most important <laughs> part is, is your own time, right? Yeah. Uh, 100% with you there. Cool. And yeah, I, I love it to how Eleanor said it's not about me, but about adding value to other people. Wise words from our construction coach. It's so inspiring. I haven't read your book yet, Eleanor, but I, now I really want to. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Amazing. Um, 
that's all for today's episode. We're running out of time. But, uh, thank you for listening and thank you especially to Eleanor for uh, Eleanor Moshe for joining us today. We've learned a lot from this session. And so again, thank you, Eleanor. Thank you for and, the opportunity and onwards and upwards to your company. Thank you very Thank much. You. No doubt about that. I'm just very fascinated at how the construction industry is so relevant to what we do. So uh, really insightful for me too. Thanks everyone. Right. So once again, this is Jacqueline Demenk. And Walter Del Barre. And stay and tuned we are for the next Mangtas. episode of Mangtas Nation. <laughs>